Hi folks, Florida Man here. Today, I bring you an after-action report on a game I played on the Versailles variant map on PlayDiplomacy.com with at least one player you guys are familiar with from earlier games, Big Gun. This game was called Dulce et Decorum est pro patria mori. We were playing with anonymous powers, which frankly never cuts in my favor with Big Gun. He usually recognizes me from my apparently distinctive communication style early on, which gives me a bit of a handicap. As you may remember, in Versailles, players are assigned one of the seven major powers of Europe and also anonymously given a minor power to play, with the major powers being Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Poland, Turkey, and the USSR, and the minor powers being Czechoslovakia, Egypt, Greece, Romania, Spain, Sweden, and Yugoslavia. In this particular instance, we were also playing with the Build Anywhere setting, which is pretty much self-explanatory, means you can put new armies and fleets in any supply center you control, as well as the Stuff Happens setting. Stuff Happens means that random events can happen, and they will. Sometimes units will do different things from what they're ordered to do, or centers will go from being in one person's possession to being neutral, or some other crazy thing like that will happen. We'll see how those effects influence this game. Anyway, I was assigned to play as the USSR and Yugoslavia. The game begins with 1931. In the spring, I negotiated with my various neighbors, but frankly I didn't have very productive discussions with anybody, at least not as the USSR. As Yugoslavia, I had pretty decent conversations with both Italy and Turkey. As USSR, my only really useful exchange was with Sweden. I assured him I wasn't going to attack him and he could leave Stockholm and go for Oslo, but he shouldn't bounce me in Finland or he'd be making an enemy. Sweden followed this good advice, and I was able to open successfully to Finland. That was my only real success in 1931 because I tried to move to Moldavia and Romania bounced me, which resulted in both of my armies bouncing, and I also bounced with Turkey in the Black Sea. Unlike the classic map, the Black Sea Bounce is a little more of a waste of resources for Turkey, and the USSR really, in the Versailles map, but he decided to bounce with me anyway, which left him with only one unit to send south to claim the neutral center of Syria. My neighbor Poland had a much better opening than me, and I congratulated him and tried to team up with Poland. My thinking in this was that since I controlled Yugoslavia and USSR, if I teamed up with Poland now, I'd be able to surround him and betray him with the power of Yugoslavia directly to the south of him later on. Unfortunately, Poland wasn't really biting. He didn't open against Germany at all, as I'd hoped he might, just moved to take the neutrals closest to him. My opening with Yugoslavia was a bit better than my opening as USSR, since I just needed to stay within striking range of any neutral center that I could negotiate to acquire. I bounced the Greek unit's attempt to move into Thessaly, which I did as a favor to Turkey, and Italy had agreed to let me into Hungary in the fall, so I was optimistic that Yugoslavia would be in good shape for fall. Interestingly, Britain opened north, which on this map is antagonistic towards Sweden, more so than to any great power, a good way of getting an easy neutral center and not taking any real risks. This was something I wasn't exactly happy about, as the other northern person besides Britain and Sweden, but I didn't communicate much with Britain in the early game, which was negligent on my part. Italy's opening was a fairly typical one, that positioned him to go after Austria and Tunisia. Germany's opening was aimed at Holland and Denmark, and France's opening was aimed at Switzerland and Belgium. It was a very conservative set of openings for most of the board, in my opinion. In fall, people started taking some interesting risks. Britain decided to convoy an army into Oslo, even though I had expressed clearly that would be an act of war against me, since that army would undoubtedly eventually come further east. Poland snuck into Prague, while the Czech unit was forced out of Austria thanks to an Italian attack with German support. Turkey bounced me in the Black Sea again, for reasons I'll never understand, even though it kept the Ankara fleet in a fairly useless position. I had hoped that Turkey and or Italy would fill in the gap that Poland left when he decided not to work with me, but at this point I kind of wrote the Turks off and tried to bind myself closer to Italy. I also bounced with Romania again, and he had convinced me that we were not going to bounce again, so I ended up, again, having two armies bounce uselessly. It was a very frustrating sequence of events. On the bright side, Yugoslavia walked into the neutral center of Hungary without opposition, as planned, Greece moved up to Thessaly in the south, while Egypt and Turkey bounced in Syria, so Turkey was stuck with one build, just like me. 
In hindsight, a major problem for me was that Romania and Turkey were both strategists, which is why I had this unexpected opposition from both of them. One of the two deciding that I was an enemy was one thing. Both of them deciding I was an enemy was a pure result of them being controlled by a single person, who I think had the wrong idea. I believe I had actually been planning to attack Romania, and Turkey just stopped me rather than trying to tell me that Romania was his minor, which made the difference between us being allies and enemies. In the West, France failed to enter orders, which was the only reason he didn't take Belgium. It was a bad first year, no sugarcoating necessary. I wasn't under attack yet, but Poland was looking stronger than me, and Britain had convoyed into Scandinavia, so I had some real worries that I might be attacked at any moment. Poland built a fleet and an army, which I was hopeful meant he was willing to join me against the British. I built a northern fleet, which could really only be used against Britain, so I was essentially going all in on this idea. I didn't want to say I was going after a power and then not do it, especially when that power had an army right on my border. That's a good way to burn your credibility with your other neighbors immediately. Turkey built a Smyrna fleet to make it easier for him to take Syria, I think. Italy built a fleet and an army, which could be useful for achieving any number of positive results. France built an army in Paris, which seemed aimed at guaranteeing he would be able to take Belgium despite having wasted his earlier opportunity. Britain built a fleet in Liverpool, which looked well positioned to take Ireland and or defend against France. Germany built only armies, which showed he was at least neutral if not friendly toward Britain. In spring 1932, Poland attacked me with everything he had, along with Turkey and Britain, surrounding my home centers and my center of Finland. I was pretty screwed at this point. On the bright side, Germany moved east, which made it look like he intended to go after Poland. Still, no one was going after Britain, and Turkey looked more or less okay in the south, too, so I was in serious trouble. France just took Belgium, as I expected. Italy just repositioned, seemingly to go after France and possibly move a fleet or two east. With the fall, Germany attacked Poland in Prague, and I counterattacked in the center, moving into Galicia and Pripyat to attack Poland next year. However, with British support, Poland took Finland and St. Pete, or Leningrad, almost chopping me in half. In the south, Italy attacked France, ensuring I couldn't possibly get any other power opening a new front with Britain. Italy also supported Egypt into Athens, destroying Greece, which strongly suggested to me that Egypt was the Italian minor. Ultimately, it would indeed turn out to be Italy's minor. Turkey finally got into Syria, since Egypt was no longer trying to take it. The only real bright spot for me was that the effect of stuff happens kicked in, which in this case meant that a national revolt occurred in British-controlled Oslo, meaning Britain lost control of that space which kept him from getting a build, even though he had acquired Ireland. France commented in the public press, I was wondering when stuff was going to start happening. Russia and I will need some more magical assistance if we're to last at all on this thing. I can't say he was wrong. I also can't say this really helped me, though. Also unfortunate, most of the public press after this are weird fart jokes or jokes about Italian garlic. I wouldn't bother checking those out if you're looking at this game. In the build phase, Italy, Egypt, and Turkey all acquired fleets, setting the stage for a Mediterranean naval war. Poland and Germany just built armies, and sadly the rest of us had no builds. In spring 1933, I was in really serious trouble. Britain walked into Leningrad, while Poland's Leningrad unit walked forward into Moscow. At the same time, I attacked Krakow. Unfortunately, while I was exchanging punches with Poland, Poland's other primary opponent of Germany was taking some serious hits. France, Britain, Sweden, and Poland all attacked Germany together, capturing Holland and Denmark. I'm not sure why France decided this was a wise decision, knowing he was under attack by Italy already. Italy walked right into Marseille this season, with no French resistance. The only real bright spot for me was that as Yugoslavia, I moved toward Turkey to join in the attack that Egypt and Italy seemed to be initiating there. Still, my position was continuing to deteriorate. In fall, it got worse again, with Poland taking another of my home centers, reducing me to Sevastopol and Krakow. Perhaps worse, Germany and Italy seemed to start fighting. Germany supported himself into Italian-controlled Austria, Italy continued to invade France, but with the alliance between him and Germany falling apart, there was little hope for any of the three of us. In the build phase, I lost my southern fleet, reducing me to only armies. On the bright side, the effect of stuff happens struck again, causing the units in Leningrad, Burgundy, Austria, Denmark, and Constantinople to be disbanded due to a plague, Romanian influenza. 
Ironically, the Romanian units were unaffected by this. In spring 1934, Poland finished me off as the USSR. I failed to advance anywhere as Yugoslavia, and at this point I was sort of giving up, frankly. The alliances I had tried to make had all withered and died, and the British-Polish alliance was seemingly strong and unbreakable, while everyone else was divided. In fall, Italy and Britain both attacked France, coming down hard and crushing him into only controlling Holland. As USSR, I didn't manage to salvage my position, while as Yugo, I just held on at my long-standing strength of two centers. Turkey attacked Egypt, but Egypt walked into undefended Smyrna at the same time, so it didn't lose any ground. Also at this point, somebody in the public press made the anonymous guess that Great Britain was me, Italy was Josie Wales, and Poland was Big Gun. Unfortunately, I was obviously not Great Britain, I wish. Big Gun was Britain, as I would eventually learn, while Poland was Josie Wales. The anonymous commenter only guessed Turkey and France correctly. They were Strategus and Charleroi, respectively. In the build phase, Italy acquired one fleet and one army, Britain acquired one fleet and two armies, and Germany and Poland just acquired armies. With spring 1935, Italy was still going after Turkey in the east, but he began pretty clearly working towards blocking up the Mediterranean Sea against possible British entry, taking the western Mediterranean and forcing Spain, which was Britain's minor, to retreat to Madrid. In the fall, Italy gave up on attacking Turkey, seemingly recognizing that the situation at the entrance of the Mediterranean was getting desperate. I was doing a great deal of nothing this whole time, by the way, just defending my little territory of Yugoslavia and not really being har attacked or harassed much there, thankfully. As this game goes on, what we see is Turkey going after Egypt and Italy, now that Italy is no longer able to spare resources to fight him, while Poland and Britain attack Germany and Italy from the north. Germany ultimately turns on Italy, knowing that he doesn't have a chance to hold on to the German homeland. Turkey takes Egypt out of the game. I continue for a long time as part of the defensive line, and there are a number of stuff happens incidents, which help us all to last a bit longer. But no effort to split up Poland and Britain is ever successful. They remain united even when their victory over the rest of us is assured. Italy gets crushed, then me, then Turkey. In the end, this is the final position. Big Gun, controlling Britain and Spain, has 20 centers under his control. Josie Wales, controlling Poland and Sweden, has 19. What's really noteworthy for me is the fact that Big Gun could clearly win here without any difficulty. He could walk right into Ireland, Denmark, Paris, and Rome, and there's not a thing Poland could do to stop it. Big Gun insisted on drawing with Josie Wales, and he insisted on calling it a joint victory rather than a draw. As the winners, of course, they can use whatever language they like to describe the result, and it was an impressive victory that showed the power of unity and skillfully applied diplomacy, allowing two players to essentially overcome the entire map by themselves. This is actually the main thing that made me want to do an after-action report on this game, by the way, along with wanting to do something else on the Versailles map. The game ended with a two-power draw, usually impossible, or theoretically impossible, on the Versailles map, despite the fact that clearly one of the players could easily have won, and he even had the power to win for a period of years leading up to the ending. They called it a shared victory, and they were certainly the only players who weren't actually defeated in the game. And, frankly, Big Gun worked harder to get this two-way draw than he would have had to to get a solo here. However, I do tend to agree with the players who commented in the public press throughout the game that this was effectively a reward for one player choosing to place his fate entirely in the hands of another player for perhaps a majority of the game. The question I place before you, my audience, is... Is this in the spirit of the game, in your opinion? Is diplomacy supposed to be played this way? Supposed to be a game in which you and another player work together from essentially beginning to end, develop a deep trust, and never betray at all? Or is it a game when you engineer your ally into being that loyal, and developing that trust, and then at the last moment you slide the knife in and stand atop a mountain of bodies to solo? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. I should note, I myself have had a game where I had a two-way draw with Big Gun which we did a video for on this channel, by the way, and I certainly saw it as an achievement, but not quite a victory. The object of the game is to drive everyone else before you, in my eyes, although I will admit that the result here is quite impressive. Big Gun is quite a contender in any case, and I think anyone is fortunate to manage to squeak out inclusion in a two-way draw with him. Just not sure I share the same perspective on the meaning of that result, although of course it's still an impressive achievement by both Gun and Josie. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this diplomacy commentary, and if so, I hope you'll like, subscribe to my channel, share with your friends. I appreciate all of you guys. 
A big round of applause for our supporters whose names now appear on screen who support the continued functioning of the channel. You too can join them, either by providing support through Patreon or by translating my videos into other languages. It's been a pleasure, my fellow alligator people. Stay safe out there. Until next time, Florida Man, out.